in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 4. And I want to thank the Lord for this opportunity. I never take it lightly. Thank the apostle and pastor of this house. God is good. I appreciate the privilege to be in the house. Yeah, you can give the Lord a hand. That's okay. So, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. It says, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Praise the Lord. Father, we just thank you for your mercy and your grace. You've already proven your presence here in this place, Lord God. We just pray that what comes out of this word is what you have to say to your people. God, I pray that our hearts would be receptive and that whatever you will be done in this place today. We thank you for driving out all distractions. We take authority over the atmosphere now. In the mighty name of Jesus, we bind every spirit of distraction and strife, pain and affliction. In the name of Jesus, we come up against rebellious spirits and complacent spirits. We bind religious spirits in the name of Jesus and render you powerless in this atmosphere where the presence of the Lord is. God, we thank you for the liberty of the Spirit of God according to your will. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Uh, this is just a base scripture. If you have heard me speak, then you know we will be all over the Bible. <laughs> so, um, but it says, uh, just to give you a little background on that situation, um, Zerubbabel, uh, this was during the time that uh, Israel was in captivity. Um, and it was, let's see, I think it was Ezra, I forget. It's, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, they, a remnant was sent back to Jerusalem to begin to rebuild the city, okay? But they were still in captivity, so they were under the authority of the king of Babylon. And, um, but Zerubbabel was, was sort of like the, the governor, so to speak, right? And, um, and so they were, you know, about to embark on this. You know, it's just a remnant. The city is in ruins. It's not even, you know, what it used to be, but they felt God directing them to do this, to rebuild the city. And so um, they were going, and the, the Lord rose up prophets. Zechariah was one of them, and began to speak words of encouragement and strength, and saying, listen, this is not going to be you doing this. It's not going to be by your power or your might or your own strength, but it's going to be by my spirit. Um, just for reference, if you ever want to look at that, that's Ezra chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. You'll see where the Lord spoke by prophets. And after that, Zerubbabel was able to raise, you know, they began to build. And so he was able to direct the building. Um, but the key here is that it's by the Spirit. Yes. And so I really want to just kind of walk through why we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, don't tune me out. <laughs> okay, I already know. Okay, if you know, just bear with me. Um, just bear with me. Okay, so the short answer to that question, why do we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is because without it, we're trying to live a spiritual life without power to do so. That's the short answer. Okay, it takes the power of the Spirit of God. So we want to um, consider, I'm going to consider this. Um, Luke chapter 10, verse 19. And then, if you can put your finger in that and then go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. And then flip over to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So the question for us to consider is, why did Jesus say these two different things in these two different ways? Luke 10, 19 and Acts 1, 8. Okay, so we're gonna do Luke 10, 19. Jesus said, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I give unto you power. All right, let's flip over to Acts 1.8. It 
This is after Jesus has been resurrected and he's appeared to multiple disciples and his followers. And he told them to wait in Jerusalem until the, until the Holy Ghost uh, came. And in this verse he says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Why did he say when he was walking with them, I give you power, but then when he was resurrected, he said, you will receive power. That sounds contradictory. Why would he say, I give you something and then say, well, now you're going to get something. It sounds contradictory, but we have to dig a little bit deeper beyond what we see in English. And so we're going to kind of look at that question. We want to understand power, what he means by power. Um, when you... When you study languages, you find out that sometimes there's not a direct word that gives the exact meaning of the original word in, in a language, okay? Um, like bad in English, it's an older slang term, but it's, we know what bad means. But if some, somebody years ago would say something was bad, they might mean it was good. Well, you had to be in our context and understand what they meant, okay? And there may not necessarily be a translation in. Spanish, for instance, for that, because if you say bad in Spanish, it means bad. It doesn't mean good, and it won't mean good. And so this is why we go to the Greek and the Hebrew. I'm just kind of explaining that, all right? This is why we go to the original Greek and Hebrew. So we want to kind of dig a little deeper, because sometimes our English doesn't quite capture the essence of what that word means, okay? So there are two words in, in, these, in these scriptures, in particular Luke, that are used for power. We translate it to power. And you probably have heard some of this before. One is exousia. It's a Greek word meaning delegated influence, authority, jurisdiction, liberty, power, right, strength. Okay, it's a token of control. So for exousia, if you will just cooperate with me and just say, if I say exousia and I cue you, you want to say authority. Okay, so just so that we can get the meaning in our head. So exousia would mean, exactly, thank you. All right, the other word is dunamis. I'm almost certain you've heard this before. Dunamis is force, is inherent power. Inherent meaning it's of that nature, it's not something that you can change, okay? Inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature, okay? Miraculous power, miracle Ability, strength, violence, might, or mighty work. So we translated that word in these verses, power, but um, for the sake of our illustration today, let's associate that word with strength. So when I say dunamis, we're going to associate that word with strength. So when we say exousia, it's, but dunamis is strength. Good. Understanding the strength is that inherent ability, okay? Um, that inherent ability. Um, just a quick example, most women, their strength is concentrated in the midsection for obvious reasons. Most men is concentrated in their upper torso. So typically, if an average woman would arm wrestle with an average man, the man is going to win because his strength is inherent in that section, right? That's where his dunamis is. All right. Um, does that make sense? Okay. So we're, going, we're asking the question, why did, why did he say, behold, I give unto you power, and then he turns around and says, you will receive power. So before Christ's resurrection, the devil, actually before Christ came, the devil had both exousia, which is, and dunamis, which is in the earth, okay? Luke, um, so a reference for that is Luke 4, 6. I'm not going to read that. During Christ's ministry, he gave his 70 followers, well, his followers, all that he sent out. I'm specifically talking about the 70 he sent out. He gave them exousia, which is authority, through his name over all the dunamis or of the devil. Or you can also think works of the devil. Okay, that's what Luke 10, 19 is saying. I'm giving you authority. I'm giving you jurisdiction, right? Influence, power. I'm giving you that authority over all of the acts, the strength of the enemy. So, but 
the real dunamis, which is, would not come to the followers of Christ until after the coming of the Holy Ghost. And that is the word that they use in Acts 1.8. So he's saying you will receive dunamis, which is after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Does that make sense? So he wasn't contradicting himself. We just didn't have a great word to translate those two. Okay? So, but how did they get that? So they had to tarry for this dunamis, right? They had to tarry for this dunamis that the Lord um, had for them. And that would come on the day of Pentecost, but they had to wait for it. Um, so it's one thing to have authority, but it's another thing to have the power to enforce that authority. And, you know, the Lord, I thought I was going to talk about something different because the Lord had been talking to me about all this stuff and I was excited about it and no, that wasn't what he wanted to talk about. So, but one thing he did say to me is, you know, uh, the apostles spoke and he's taught us about demons, demonic powers. And this illustration, demonic powers are like squatters. You know what squatters are? A squatter is a person who will illegally take residence in a, like an empty building or on property on land. Okay, that's a squatter. So if there's an empty building, somebody doesn't have a home, they come and they find it, and they just make their residence. Some people have, go all out, like they have their furnishings, they have their stuff, they are squatters. Now, if you own that home and there's someone illegally in there, you have the authority to put them out. But you don't really have the power to put them out. What you have to do is call somebody with the power to get them out. You call the police, right? You call judges, and then they come and they have the power to make them leave your home. Does that make sense? So demons are like squatters. They're not going to just get up and leave because you own the home. They're not going to get up and leave because you say, you got to get up out of here. I'm trying to sell this house. They're going to be like, okay, but I'm here. And there's some places that even give squatters rights. Rights. You've been in this home this long. Nobody came to claim it. Okay, you have a right to stay. But see, demons are like squatters. But we need to know as people of God, they don't ever have a right to stay. So what you need to do is make sure that there aren't any legal loopholes that they can slip through. Right? But it takes the dunamis, which is the... of the Holy Ghost to get them out of there. You have the authority, but it takes dunamis to get them up out of there. Okay. All right. So they had to wait for the power. They had to wait for that, author that um, dunamis. Okay. So that they could have the power not only to say in Jesus' name you go, but that dunamis within them would rise up and make them go. Okay. So that is what the Holy Spirit brings into the life of a believer. He brings that divine strength the mighty acts of God, the supernatural into the life of a believer, into manifestation in the life of a believer. Make sense? Okay. Now, I had a scripture that I absolutely do not have written down here and do not have my word. So can somebody please read Philippians chapter 4, verse 13? If you do not mind. Philippians chapter 4. All right, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. We've heard that before, right? That word strengtheneth in the Greek is, is mm, endunamao, endunamao, dunamis, endunamao, dunamis. They come from the same root word. It comes from the same root word as dunamis. It means to enable, to empower, to make strong, to increase in strength. So when we say, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me, how does he strengthen in me? He gives me the dunamis, which is strength, through the power of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Now, just um, for clarity's sake, thank you for reading that. Um, just for clarity's sake, Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, he is God. He is a person. We say the Holy Ghost. Some people say Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Same person. It's okay to say the Holy Ghost because you say the pastor, but you understand the pastor is a person, right? If you just want to say Holy Ghost, like you're calling a name, that's fine too. 
that make sense? I just want to make sure we're clear on who Holy Spirit is. So if I say Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Ghost means Spirit, Spirit means Ghost, it's the same thing. Okay. All right. So I can do all things through Christ who empowers me, who gives me that power through the Holy Spirit. So what that means is the enemy doesn't, not only does he not have uh, exousia, which is authority over our lives. Now, through the power of the Holy Ghost, he also has no dunamis, which is okay. Praise God. So the kingdom of God has come to destroy all those works, all those acts of the devil. But it's really important to know that this is what we have as believers and what we have a right to. Okay? All right. Um, let's talk about Holy Spirit baptism briefly. Let me just say, I am no expert on the Holy Spirit, okay? Just to, this is what he asked me to speak about, reading, studying. So this is not exhaustive, meaning this is not the full list of who he is and what he does. He does supernatural things that we don't have time to talk about, even if I knew how to talk about all of it, okay? Um, so now, there's, is there a difference between having the Holy Spirit at salvation and when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit? Short answer, yes, okay? Um, the Holy Spirit is definitely present when you are, um, when you're saved. According to John 14, seven, St. John chapter 14, verse seven, and I'm gonna read it in two translations. John chapter 14, verse, I'm sorry, 17. 1417. If you want to read what Jesus specifically said about Holy Spirit, you can read John chapters like 13 through 15, 16. Those are good chapters to read. So John 14, 17 in the King James says, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and he shall be in you. The New Living Translation says, he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because he isn't looking for him and, he, and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Okay? So when we're saved, Holy Spirit is present. The Holy Spirit is present to convict us of sin, right? To let us convince us that we need Jesus. And when we, we can make our confession of faith, he bears witness that we're children of God. You hear people say, I felt lighter, or they might start weeping. But he makes it known that, yes, you are now a child of God. He's with you. And Jesus' promise is, I will never leave you or forsake you. So he won't leave you, but he's with you. But that verse says he was with you and shall be in you. So is there a difference? Yes. Okay. So... But it, it says, um, let's, let's read Acts chapter 1, verse 5. So the Holy Spirit is present with us at salvation, but he will be in us when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 5, and we are also after that going to flip to 2, 4, but um, just so you know. So Acts 1, 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So the word baptize, that Greek word baptize, literally means to make overwhelmed or, to, or fully wet, to dip repeatedly, to immerse or submerge. So if you think of, um, if you think of submerging something in water, making it completely wet, that's baptism. That's the word. So when we get baptized in water, we get submerged. When we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, we get submerged. Okay? Um, flip over to Acts 2, 4. Chapter 2, verse 4. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, it says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It says filled Submerged or filled? Which one is it? Do we get fully wet or do we get filled? Well, let's think about it. Let's imagine that you have a sink full of water and you have a glass that's empty. 
and you put that glass, you submerge that glass in the water. What happens to the glass? It gets filled. It gets filled. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we are submerged, we are fully immersed in the Holy Spirit, and he fills us. When you pull the glass out straight up, it's filled. What happens if there's a top on the glass? Does it get filled? No, no, it doesn't. Come out as empty. It'll be wet, but it will be as empty as it was when it went in. What happens if there's an obstruction in the glass? I don't know. Let's say some child was playing paint or goop in it, and now there's a big old lump of goop in it. You submerge it in water. Is it going to get filled? Yeah, it'll get filled, but there's something in the way. So you won't get the full benefit of if the, as if the glass were empty. So let's think about us. When we get... When we, get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and we're just in the presence of the Lord. You can be in the presence of the Lord and just kind of feel it and just washing over you and nothing's really going on with you. That's when you want to check and make sure that you don't have any hindrances, okay? Any unforgiveness in your heart or any anger toward anybody or just fear. Fear is evil, people. Do not think fear is benign and don't think it's you. Fear is an evil spirit and he needs to be, it needs to be driven out, okay? Um... Whatever it is, there may be a blockage there. I don't know what it is. There might be sin in your life. You're repeatedly sinning or saying no to God and you know what he's saying to you. That could be a block. Top is on. But then what happens is sometimes when we come to the Lord, he's with us, but, and he can fill us with the Holy Ghost, but sometimes, you know, some of the spirits that we had when we were saved, some he causes, he drives right out when we get saved. Others, you need to be delivered from. And it's no shame. You're coming out of darkness into light. So some of that darkness just has to be driven out. It's a squatter. But you just have to cooperate with the one who has the dunamis, which is strength, to drive out that evil spirit. There's no shame in you. Once you clean that glass of that obstruction, the glass can be used for whatever you want to use it. But it takes the power of God. It takes the dunamis of God. And that's the Holy Spirit. Um, Holy Spirit baptism is the fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus Christ coming in the flesh was the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Holy Spirit baptism is the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Let's turn to Joel chapter 2. Some of you are familiar with that. Joel chapter 2. It's in the, it's in the minor prophet, so it's going to be a little bit closer to the New Testament. Joel chapter 2, we're going to start at verse 28. We're still talking about Holy Spirit baptism, but the point that we want to make here is that it is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And so in old, this may not be news to you, but in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would come and he would rest on people. Okay, because we had not been, you know, God still can't dwell in a dirty vessel. That's why you don't get baptized in the Holy Ghost before you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Okay. So once Jesus Christ comes in your life, he cleans you enough that the spirit of God can be in your life. Okay. And the additional cleaning, sometimes you might have to soak a little bit. You know how it is when you have a pan, dish needs to soak a little bit before you can get all that gunk out. Okay. It's okay. You just have to soak a little bit. Um, so, but it is the fulfillment of prophecy. So Joel chapter two, verse 28 says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Let's jump down to verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Shall will be what? Delivered. delivered. In the King James it says delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Praise the Lord. So what I was starting to say is that in the Old Testament the spirit would come and rest upon people. But he didn't just rest on everybody. Come on now. He just rested on the prophets <laughs> and the priests and the kings and not even all of them. But he would come and he would rest on them and when he was finished, whoop, he left. 
So not everybody could get this access to the presence of God, to the spirit of God. They had to hear. They could only hear what God was saying through the priests, the prophets, and the kings. That's it. The priest, the prophet, and the king. And that's why he said, write this on your heart. Teach, teach it. But there was another, there's another scripture which I didn't think about, so I didn't look it up. But that says that, you know, you won't have to have somebody to teach you. It doesn't mean you don't need a teacher at all. It means that when he pours out his spirit on all flesh, Holy Spirit will begin to teach you. Okay? You won't have to only rely on the priests, the kings, and the prophets. Okay? So that means that we can't live our lives just waiting for a word from a prophet. The presence of the spirit of God now is, has been poured out upon all flesh. But remember, not everybody has been submerged. <laughs> it's just like salvation. Everybody has access, but everybody has not accessed it. Okay? All right. So it is the fulfillment of scripture. So let's talk a little bit about the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I'm just going to kind of run through a few things. Again, this is not the total list. It's just what came to my heart, okay? And I'm going to state it, and then I'm going to give you the scripture, and I'm not going to read the scripture unless I, you know, feel like. So don't feel like you need to flip, because you know me. I've got like 50 scriptures. Okay. All right. So the first thing, <laughs> he bears witness that we belong to God. Yes. He meaning the Holy Spirit. He bears witness that we belong to God. Romans 8, 16. Okay, I might read it. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Romans 8, 16. Second thing. He is our advocate. He is our advocate. And the scripture for that is John chapter 14, verse 16. Hmm. Let me back up. If you would also write Ephesians 1.13 for that first one. He bears witness that we belong to God. Ephesians 1.13 is also a scripture. And I just encourage you, in the time that you read, you know, if you want to go back and look at these things, um, you know, you might need a little bit more time to chew on it, meditate on it. But the second thing was he is our advocate. And in John 14.16, Jesus is saying, I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter who will abide with you forever. And comforter in the Greek um, is parakletos. And it's someone who pleads another's cause before a judge or with that person. So somebody who pleads another's cause. Because Jesus is our advocate, but he's on the right hand of the Father. Holy Spirit is our advocate right down here with us. Okay? Um, so it's a counsel for the defense. It's an intercessor. One who pleads another's cause before a judge. Okay, counsel for the defense. You know, saying, no, they're not guilty. An intercessor, a helper, an assistant. Did you know that you could say, Holy Spirit, I need your help. And he will come and help you, give you a little bit more grace, give you what you need to say, whatever. Did you know you could do that? Yeah, you could do that. That's, that's his role in our lives. He teaches us, number three, he teaches and reminds us. He teaches us and he reminds us. He brings things to our remembrance. And the scripture for that is John chapter 14, verse 26. And so sometimes you might be sharing with someone or just talking and you're like, Holy Spirit, I need you to bring that back to my mind. He'll bring it back to your mind. That's his role in our lives. So remember the short answer to why we need the baptism is because without it, we're trying to live a spiritual life without the power of the spirit of God. These are the, this is him as a resource in our lives, a spiritual resource in our lives, beyond our intellect, beyond our understanding. This is his role. He, um, number four, he testifies about Christ. He testifies testifies um, is to bear record or to bear witness or give evidence. He gives evidence about Christ. The scripture for that is John chapter 15, verse 26. Right, he will testify about Christ. Interesting, he gives evidence. 
He's our advocate and he gives evidence. Interesting, so if we are talking to someone about Christ and we start, we say, well, can I pray with you? And they say, yeah, you can pray with me. That's when Holy Spirit comes to give evidence. He's gonna present his evidence, right? And then his power might come. They might feel warm. They might feel, they might cry. They may not cry, but they might feel like crying, right? Because the Holy Spirit is there to testify of Jesus Christ to give some evidence that what you were saying is true. Number five, he convicts and convinces the unsaved about their sin. Convicts or convinces the unsaved about their sin. And that scripture is John 16, verse eight. It's not our job to convince anybody that they're a sinner. It's not our job to convince anyone that they're a sinner. It's our job to present Jesus Christ and let the Holy Spirit convince them that they're a sinner. And then he can give evidence that he's real, right? And then he can be present with them when they confess Jesus Christ as their savior. Number six, he guides in truth. He guides in truth. The scripture for that is John 16, 13. In that same verse, so that was he guides in truth. Number seven is actually in that same verse. He shows things to come. He shows things to come. Same verse. John chapter 16, verse 13. He shows things to come. That's where prophecy comes in, right? But not only that, he can just give you, he can show you some of the things that are coming. It doesn't have to be a prophet, you know? You don't have to be, have the gift of prophecy for the Holy Spirit within you to show you what's coming and to warn you of it or to to direct you. But you have to be tuned in to hear it. All right, so he, number eight, He glorifies Christ by revealing what he receives from him, from Christ. He glorifies Christ by revealing what he receives from him. That's the very next verse, John chapter 16, verse 14. He glorifies Christ by revealing what he receives from him. So if you're hearing from the Holy Spirit, you're hearing the mind of God. You're hearing what God wants to say. And number nine, he keeps us from fulfilling fleshly desires. He keeps us from fulfilling fleshly desires. Galatians chapter five, verses 16 and 18. Galatians five, verses 16 and 18. He keeps us from fulfilling fleshly desires He keeps us from fulfilling fleshly desires. Galatians 5, 16 says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 18 says, but if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. That guilt that the enemy keeps trying to bring back up, if you're walking in the spirit, mm mm-mm. No, we're not under that. I'm not under this legal system anymore. I'm walking in the spirit. So that's what, these are some of the things that Holy Spirit does in our lives, just some. So back to why we need Holy Spirit back to baptism. And these scriptures I really want to read. I really want to kind of go into these. Why do we need Holy Spirit baptism? I do have a few things here, <laughs> a few. Number one, to have a spiritual mind. Why do we need Holy Spirit baptism? Why can't we just, you know, it's okay. I don't have to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. It's optional. I'm still saved. I'm going to heaven. It's all good. We need the Holy Spirit baptism to have a spiritual mind. Romans chapter eight, verse six. You can turn there. Romans chapter eight, verse six. Romans 8, 6. So why do we need the Holy Spirit baptism? We need the Holy Spirit baptism to have a spiritual mind. Romans 8, 6 says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. 
Now that word minded in the Greek is talking about your mental inclination or your purpose, your thoughts and your purposes, the intents of your mind, okay? Spiritually minded. And if you stay in Romans 8, verse 6, I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation, and I'm going to go ahead and read down through verse 8, okay? So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws. And it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. We need the Holy Spirit baptism to be spiritually minded. Second reason that we need the Holy Spirit baptism is to overcome the flesh. We need Holy Spirit baptism to overcome the flesh. Stay in Romans 8. And we're going to read verse 13. For, and I'm reading this one. I, I've got all these versions. I'm going to read this in the um, English Standard Version. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So flesh doesn't mean what we can pinch. Flesh means your, your natural human desires right, and inclinations. You know, the natural human desire that if somebody hits you, you're swinging on them. That flesh, okay? The natural human desire to overeat, right? The natural human desire to let someone know exactly what you think of what they just said. Not in a good way, okay? That natural. So we need the Holy Spirit to overcome the flesh. Because remember, the Holy Spirit is what gives us the dunamis, which is our strength. So we need the Holy Spirit, not just for the authority over the flesh, but for the strength to put that flesh under. Because the flesh, the only way to overcome the flesh is to kill it. So it's going to hurt your natural inclinations, but the Holy Spirit is there to strengthen you to put that flesh to death. So yeah, you'll kind of squirm a little bit when you don't get to say what you wanted to say. But the Holy Spirit is there to give you the strength to do it. Right? If we're not, if we're not under that power of the Holy Spirit, we might say it anyway. Or we might say it in another way, you know? Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm just speaking the truth in love. You know? That way. So we need the Holy Spirit to overcome our flesh. Number three, we need the Holy Spirit to keep in step with the Spirit. We need Holy Spirit baptism to keep in step with the Spirit. So the scriptures for that, we read part of it, is Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. And you can turn, I'll be reading there from the English Standard Version. And then we're also going to jump down to verses 24 and 25. So as you're turning to Galatians 5, um, the mandate for us is to walk in the Spirit. So let's read what it says. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. In this case, it means the things that you want to do as a believer, okay? But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So our mandate is to walk in the spirit. And in those verses, particularly verse 16, the Greek word for walk means to live, to deport yourself, okay? To conduct yourself. It's talking about your lifestyle. So when it says walk in the spirit, it means make your lifestyle one, all right? But if we read uh, verses 24 and 25, we're gonna see the word walk used again. I'm gonna read it in the English Standard Version. 
Verse 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the spirit, let us also, I believe in the King James it says walk. It says keep in step with the spirit. And the reason that that is a good translation of that is because in the Greek, this is a different word that they use in the Greek for walk. It means to march in rank. It means to keep step, to conform to, or walk orderly. So it means to keep in step. If you've ever seen a movie or been in the military or seen military, march, seen them in a parade, what do they do? They keep step. They keep formation. When one person's left foot goes down, everybody's left foot goes down. When one person's right foot goes down, everybody's right foot goes down. They keep in step. And that is the word that is used in those latter verses to say, if we're living by the Spirit, let's also walk. Let's also keep in step. So it's not just our lifestyle, it's keeping in step. How do I keep in step with the Spirit? If I'm baptizing the Holy Spirit, then I can listen and he can talk to me, right? Because he's inside of me. And so then when I'm walking along and I'm saying, okay, I'm going to do this. And he says, no, 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 don't do that. But I'm going to keep in step. I'm not going to lag behind, do it anyway. They'd be like, oh man, that's what he was trying to tell me. And yes, that's happened to me a lot, unfortunately. But we can keep in step with the Spirit. Number four, why do we need baptism in the Holy Spirit? For the operation and manifestation of the spiritual gifts. For the operation and manifestation of the spiritual gifts. Uh, that's 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 11. 1 Corinthians 4, verses uh, 12, excuse me, verses 4 through 11. We need them for the operation and manifestation of the spiritual gifts. Um, and it's talking about the various gifts. And you'll see he talks about the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge by the spirit, faith by the same spirit, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, Discernment, meaning being able to distinguish between spirits. Discerning when you see or hear something, whether it's of God or not. Okay? Uh, the gifts of tongues and interpretation of tongues. Verse 11 says, these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions or distributes to each one individually as he wills. We all have spiritual gifts. We all have spiritual gifts. We all have spiritual gifts, but we may never come into them if we don't come into not only the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but learning how to hear and walk with the Spirit. We may not fully come into them. Yes, you have a spiritual gift. If you've given your heart to the Lord, he has a plan for you that has something to do with the Holy Ghost, okay? Because the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the dunamis or the to execute the will of God. And so we need him for that manifestation of the spiritual gifts. Yes, you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, but those spiritual gifts, that supernatural extra, that's the power of the Holy Ghost. That's the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, we also need the Holy Spirit to, number five, to fight this spiritual battle. It's a battle. We need him to fight this spiritual battle. If you think that some of the things that come to your mind are just things that came to your mind, you're mistaken. It's a spiritual battle. And so you need the Holy Spirit to be able to overcome that. The scriptures for that are Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, and 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 4. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, and 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 4. And I am going to read those. Ephesians 6 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Now, if you flip to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Bear with me. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 and 4 say, For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, or carnal, as it says in the King James, but have divine 
power or divine dunamis, which is, right, those mighty works, the supernatural, to destroy strongholds. Why do we need baptism in the Holy Spirit? Because you just saying, devil, I just don't have time for you today, is not going to be enough to get him out of your home. Because you just saying, can you just pray for me? May not be enough. It may not be on time enough for you to get the deliverance that you need in that moment. So if you have the power of the Holy Ghost working on the inside of you, you may not have to dial those seven digits and call the apostle or call the minister. You say, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over this atmosphere right now. And the Holy Ghost in you is going to empower you to execute the will of God. That's the power of the Holy Ghost. Does, we don't, we're not living in the Old Testament time where the Spirit of God just rests on the prophets and the pastors and the teachers. That fivefold ministry, and he gave some, right? Pastors, he gave some. But he didn't say, I give gifts to some. He didn't say, I gave the Holy Ghost to some. He said, I just gave these gifts for the perfecting, the maturing of the saints, right? Till we all, to how many of us? We all come to a perfect, meaning a mature man. How are we all going to come? If Joel says, I pour out, I will pour out my spirit upon how much of the flesh? All flesh. That means every single one of us who have named the name of Christ have a right to seek and receive the power of the Holy Spirit through Holy Spirit baptism. So you're like, okay, but I'm already baptized in the Holy Ghost. So what we need to do, those of us who are filled with the Holy Spirit, some of us need a little refilling. Okay, but you need to tap into the spirit of God because if we're not doing these things then that means there's more for us in the spirit. Um, let's keep going. Okay. Um, number six, we need the Holy Spirit to know what God has for us. The scripture that goes with that is first Corinthians chapter two. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 through 12. We need the Holy Spirit to know what God has for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things... God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we can understand the things freely given to us by God. See, it's, it's good to say no eyes seen, no ears heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, but you need to know that God reveals it to you by his spirit. You can know what God has for you. You can know. Number seven, we need the Holy Spirit baptism to understand spiritual things. To understand spiritual things. We're already in... 1 Corinthians, I'm going to read a little bit further down in chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 13 and 14. So we need the Holy Spirit baptism to understand spiritual things. The natural man can't understand spiritual things, right? The scripture says, and let's see, 1 Corinthians 2, 13 and 14. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly or foolishness to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So our intellect, our reasoning, and even just study of the Bible alone is not going to reveal everything that God has to reveal to you. You need the Spirit of God. Okay? The Spirit of God, he reveals it, he teaches us, he instructs us, and then he manifests it. Right? So in that verse, discerned, it means to scrutinize, to question, 
to investigate, to determine or to judge of, to estimate. So let's, let's think about this. Oh, to determine the excellence or defects or faults of any person or thing. That's what discern means. Foolishness means a lack of good sense, you know. So what does that mean? Okay, it means we need to be able to understand spiritual things. It means the natural man can't understand spiritual things. Do you know what that means for us as followers of men and women of God? Our mind, our intellect is not going to understand leadership. So we shouldn't be questioning or judging leadership. We shouldn't be judging one another. Why? Because we have to ask the spirit of God for the understanding. So when we start evaluating, just trying to discern, to scrutinize and question, well, I don't know why, why did the apostle do that? Why did the pastor do this? Why did the minister say that? What they mean by that? I don't know. And you know what you go and do? Sometimes, not all of us, some of us, we actually go to another human spirit and we try to figure out, we try to discern this spiritual thing with our natural mind. With our intellect, right? With our own understanding. Well, I don't know. Do you think? I don't know. I don't know. But you know what? I ain't like that. I don't like the way that. You know what? I'm not even messing with that. I'm just, mm -mm. So we all are trying to, we're trying to take our natural mind and intellect and will and understanding and what we know of the word of God in the natural and try to figure out what God has given to the leadership in the spirit. You can't figure out spiritual things with your natural mind. I can't figure out spiritual things with my natural mind. So when I go to questioning things with my natural thing, the first thing, really the only thing I need to do is ask the one who gave it in the spirit. You go to the spirit of God and you say, I need understanding here because I'm not understanding, but I don't want to be out of order or out of line. And I know I can't go talking to somebody else because they might not understand either. That's what that means. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. See, remember Moses, uh, Miriam, and, and, and Aaron, they're the brothers and sisters. Look, we got God too. They said, where, where we have God too? Moses, I don't know what he, I don't, you know, he takes too much on himself. He just, he's just doing too much. And you know what the Lord did? He went right to them. He says, now, I talked to him face to face. I might give a dream to a prophet, but this one I'm talking to face to face. And you had the, you didn't even have enough humility and understanding to know that anybody that God is talking to face to face, I probably don't know everything that's going on in that conversation. So spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Wait, I thought we were talking about the power of the Holy Ghost. We are. See, the power of the Holy Ghost will keep my flesh under when my intellect wants to take over. And I said, mm-mm. That's what he gave the leadership. That's what I'm going to do. If I have a question, I'm going to God. Because it doesn't matter how smart I am. It doesn't matter how much wisdom I might have. Because if I'm under leadership and I believe that God gave this leadership to me, then I have to just concede to the spirit of God and go to the spirit of God when I need some understanding. That's why we need the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And that's why we need to stay in step with the Holy Spirit. Because you can be baptized in the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost is over here and you're just chilling. You're not even listening. You're just on your phone. You're in the TV. You're doing work. You're doing life. And you look up and the Spirit is doing something. You're like, wait, 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 wait. What? 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 Okay, well, let me try to catch up now. Right? And if we're not careful, we will think that because we're not there, somebody else is not supposed to be there. Right? Okay. So we need the spirit of God in us. Every single person needs the spirit of God. Every single believer needs the presence and the power of God working actively in your life. And I know how hard it can be to spend time, regular time in the presence of the Lord, but we still need it. I somehow find a way to eat. I somehow find a way to sleep a little bit. Got to find a way to get into the presence of God. Got to find a way. So how do we become these spiritual people? Well, first you got to be saved. Let's make sure we keep everything in order, right? This is not for those who are un unbelievers. If you're an unbeliever, you need Jesus in your heart, in your life. You need to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You need to confess your sins to him, repent of your sins, and ask him to come into your heart. Then you'll be a believer, and then you can qualify for the next step. <laughs> right? You have to be in the kingdom. But then you have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We need to be submerged and filled with the Holy Spirit so that when we come up out of there, we're full of what was in that sink, which is the presence of God, right? We're full of the Spirit of God. Then we need to keep in step with the Spirit. 
They need to walk in step with the Spirit, right? We, we saw that in Galatians chapter 5. We need to keep in step with the Spirit. How do I keep in step with the Spirit? You've got to spend some time with Him. He's a person. Spend time with Him. It, have you ever seen a married couple that doesn't live in the same house? They don't talk to each other? I'm not talking about situations where, you know, like life situations like, you know, job, somebody's job is overseas. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know what? We love each other. We're going to get married. But I'm just going to live here and you can live over there. We're going to have a great relationship. You've got to spend time together. You've got to spend time to make the relationship work. I don't care what kind of relationship it is. Friendships, family relationships, spousal relationships. You have to spend time. And you can't get around it. And you want to get around it, right? You're like, mm, what I got on Sunday is going to take me all week long. Probably not. Because we know how it is when the glory is here and then we go and the enemy comes, bam, and slams us with something. You need the power of the Holy Ghost on the inside to rise up and be able to recognize what the enemy's trying to do and say, uh-uh, you're not going this far. Squatters have no rights here. <laughs> right? Squatters don't have any rights here. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The only person who could be here is me and the Holy Ghost. That's it. No more. So that's why we need deliverance. And it's okay to need deliverance. It's not okay to need it and not have it. It's not okay to need it and not acknowledge it. Right? It's okay to need it because you know where to go to get the help. It's not okay to be like, mm -mm, that's not me. I don't have that. Mm, nope. You know why? Just denying it is not going to make it go away. It's not going to make it go away. And you are not that spirit, but you can be cooperating with it. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to cooperate with spirits. And I will tell you something that the Holy Spirit told me. Some of us don't really want deliverance because we don't want the responsibility that comes with the freedom. We're afraid that God is going to require something of us that we don't really want to give or we don't have to give. Some of us kind of like our habits. We're just going to like it. Some of us still have the fears that we're going to be taken advantage of. And so we're just embracing these spirits, these squatters in the temple of the Holy Ghost. Squatters have no right. They have no place in this temple of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says, know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost and the spirit of God dwells in you. Does the spirit of God have any cooperation with demons? Absolutely not. So that spirit of rebellion gotta go. That spirit of backbiting and murmuring, it's gotta go. Because this temple is for the Holy Ghost. And that's the determination we have to have. It's okay that you identify the need. It's not okay that knowing the need, you're still okay with it. Because nobody's going to talk to me and I'm just not. So I'm proud of the fact that I can say what I want to say and just that's just it. Praise the Lord. But the Holy Spirit doesn't get glory. God doesn't get glory that way. And then the manifestation of the gifts. Can you imagine? This is what happens. Let me tell you what could possibly happen if we don't allow the Lord to free us up so that there's no stuff in the midst of that cup that got submerged. We could be used by the power of God. And then the enemy pushes that button in that area where that squatter, that spirit lives. And we just go off. And then we feel miserable. And we got to go repent. And we're like, oh, God. And then we have to deal with the mental stuff that comes, right? You repent and you're forgiven, but then the enemy tries to work on that mind because I yielded to that which was in me that I didn't want to release. If it's identified, then God is, that means God is ready to deal with it. And praise the Lord, you can be free. Praise God, you can be free. And you will like the results. You will. You'll like the results. So we spend time with the Holy Spirit, we listen to the Holy Spirit, and we yield and obey the Holy Spirit. Um, Ephesians 3, chapter 20, excuse me, chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. 
Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21. It says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power, the dunamis that works in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. The New Living Translation says, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. And I wanna just share this um, before I sit down. I was sharing this with um, my dad. I was watching um, just a young minister, young, like in his 20s minister um, on YouTube. And he was sharing with some people, a group of young people, and he was talking about how the Lord broke that spirit of fear because he was, you know, a believer filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said, um, you know, because he was afraid to, you know, talk about God at school. You know, he's a high school student. He just wants to be a student, you know, go home and do, do what he does. But the Lord just kind of started, you know, nudging him. So I skipped a little bit, so I missed some of it. But what I caught was he was in school one day at the lockers and a young lady just came and touched him on the shoulder. Power of God, like the spirit started manifesting right there in the hallway at the lockers during the class change. She fell on the ground. She's foaming at the mouth. Not everybody who has a spirit foams at the mouth. So let me just make that clear. Okay. <laughs> this lady, young lady did. Okay. I don't know, she was not a believer either. Okay. So he was like, ooh. Her or class? Her or class? What did he do? What do you think he did? He went to class, okay? <laughs> he went on to class. But guess what? Guess who sits beside him in that class? Yeah, that girl did. Yes, she, she sits beside him in class. He was like, oh. So Holy Spirit was trying to kind of get him out of himself, himself, you know. He's filled with the Holy Ghost, but he just like, okay, Holy Ghost, now not right here. She comes to class, sits down, and he said, you okay? She said, yeah. He said, he's like, oh, do you want to accept Jesus? She was like, what? Do you want to accept Jesus? Why? He said, you don't know what just happened to you? He said, never, never, never mind, never mind. Can I just pray for you? She's like, yeah, sure. This is in class. I don't know. This is in the United States of America, okay? This is not a joke. Like, so, so he grabs her hand, and the spirit starts manifesting again in the girl. <laughs> so right in the middle of the class, this young man had to say, in the name of Jesus, you are free. Lord set the girl free from the demon. The young lady gave her heart to the Lord. Yeah, we can give God glory for that. What a beautiful testimony, right? But it doesn't stop there. So these little things started happening. So people finally, some guys were like, who are you? He was like, uh, I'm me. You know, he's still a teenager, so he's like, uh, I'm me. I said, no, 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 who are you? What, what do you have? He's like, um, hair, shirt. You know, he's being a teenager. So he said, no, 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 you have something different. He goes, oh, yeah, I have Jesus in my heart. So I want what you have. Now, what do they want? They wanted that dunamis. They saw that power at work. Led this young man to the Lord, and the Lord began doing these things. He said, one day he came to school. He walked in the door, and he was like, who? Who? All these students are waiting for him. Him and they're like, we want, we want you to pray. Can you pray for me? I'm depressed. Can you pray for me this and this? Can you pray for me this and this? This is a teenager in high school in the United States of America. But it's not just him. It was the power of the Holy Ghost inside of him. See, his pastor wasn't there. Pastor didn't go to school. All right? He was there, though, and the Holy Ghost. So he starts basically turn, ministering to people in school till it got to the point where administration was like, okay, wait one minute. So they have a meeting with a student, guidance counselors, principals, assistant principals. They say, listen, 
what are you doing? You know you can't preach in school, which by the way, the kids can, the teachers can't. Hmm. If me, a Holy Spirit-filled teacher, can't preach the gospel, it might be important to have a Holy Spirit-filled student somewhere <laughs> to touch the lives of the other children. So anyway, he's in there like, you know, you can't do this, and what are you doing? And then he was like, well, well can I say something? Like, yeah, 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 talk. Well, haven't you noticed that the kids are happier? Oh, yeah. Haven't you noticed that some of the kids who were depressed aren't depressed anymore? The kids who were said they were going to commit suicide aren't going to do it anymore? That this kid who was in a wheelchair, listen to what I'm saying, people of God. This kid who was in a wheelchair can walk now? Well, yeah, yeah, I noticed that. He was like, and you, listen, this is the Holy Ghost. I love Jesus. You got to love the Holy Ghost. He said, and you, he's talking to his principal. You, you, have, you haven't been able to sleep. There's something, you've been depressed since you were a teenager and you cannot shake it. Power of God hits the principal. Principal falls on his knees weeping. This is not a lie, people, okay? Falls on his knees weeping, crying. He accepts Jesus. The young man continues to minister to the other adults in the room. The power of God hit him and I guess they left him alone because he's preaching the gospel right now. I love that. And I will freely admit that I'm a little late, a little behind the curve, but I'm here now. Me and the Holy Ghost, we're here now. I might be a little late, but I'm here. So this is why we need the Holy Ghost. This is why you can't just rely on the Holy Ghost in your mama or your daddy or your brother or your sister. Right? You can't just rely on the Holy Ghost. Listen, sometimes you can't get through to the apostle and the pastor. But you have the Holy Spirit, the power of God to demonstrate what God said in his word, the power, the dunamis of God, that strength, the mighty acts to do the supernatural. Yes, you can be 10. Yes, you can be 50. And the power of God can be operating actively in your life. And you'll be right in step. You get to the house of God and the things that the Lord was talking to you in secret, you hear it over the pulpit. Why do you hear it over the pulpit? Because you're in step with the spirit. You won't have a bunch of time or desire to spend time on the phone or texting or whatever it is, communicating with somebody in the, in the natural about spiritual things without the understanding. Because we're in step now with the Holy Ghost. We're in step with what God is saying. We're in step with what God is doing. You won't have to. See, there's no law against that. You won't have to worry about guilt either. You said, no, uh -uh. in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that spirit of guilt because you'll be discerning now in the spirit. You'll start knowing when the thought is of you and when it's of the enemy. You'll start noticing, oh, no, no, no. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So whatever God has given me to do, I can do it. You'll start relying on the Holy Spirit and becoming familiar with his voice so that God can operate actively in your life and that being a believer won't just be about, I'm just trying to make it in. There's a work to be done and we can't all do it and it's not all going to happen at the pulpit. Some of the people that God will touch through your life will never step foot through these doors. But they've got the Holy Ghost right there. They have access to the power of God. So they don't have to come here to get the experience. They just need somebody who's in step and in tune with the Spirit of God. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly, above all that we could ask or imagine, according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church hallelujah so why do we need the baptism of the holy spirit because the word of god says not by power not by might but by my spirit saith the lord praise the lord glory to god hallelujah glory to god